Over the last couple of years of running this YouTube channel, I like to think that we've built a little bit of a community around CRG. There is the Discord, the link's in the description and everyone is more than welcome. And over on said Discord, I was recently talking to one of my patrons, Jarvis1187, or to give him his proper name, Christian. I was talking to him about his Amiga 600, which is in this box. Christian was having a few problems with it. I offered to help. He sent it in. So let's see if we can fix it. So let's take a look at what we're dealing with. Letter. Hi Glenn, this is it now, my broken Amiga 600. As I already told you, it doesn't turn on at all and it got worse after I tried to swap some capacitors myself. After my efforts, even the power supply started to screech when the Amiga is plugged in and turned on. So yes, Christian only recently got this Amiga 600. It didn't work though, so I suggested it maybe just needed a recap. He did try that, or he tried swapping some of the caps anyway, but it didn't fix anything and in fact his power supply started making strange noises and that's why he's included it here as well. It would be lovely if you can do anything about that. As we discussed, it's perfectly fine for me if you use electrolytic capacitors. The cap kit that Christian had bought originally was just ceramic caps. I would prefer not to put ceramic caps into the 600 in place of the original electrolytics. I have talked about that before in other videos. And so in this case, we'll be removing any of the ceramics that Christian fitted and we'll just fit all new electrolytics. If everything works, I kindly ask you for one more thing. Could you remove the RF modulator afterwards so I'll never have to try soldering on the Amiga ever again? I am planning on installing an RGB to HDMI mod which parts I already have on hand at its place to use on modern displays. Yep, that is no problem. We can easily remove the RF modulator. And in fact, if we remove that, I think I'm right in saying we can also then leave out a few capacitors. Thank you very much again for your help in advance. Greetings from Germany, Christian. So yes, he sent all this all the way from Germany. But I don't mind looking at it for him. There's the power supply, there's the Amiga itself, all wrapped up. It is a lovely example of a 600, very white. Case does need a little bit of a clean, but I'm sure we can sort that for Christian. The more important thing though, is getting this working. Before we do anything with the machine though, I wanna take a quick look inside the power supply. Because if this was making funny noises, it sort of makes me wonder if something has maybe been shorted, stressing the power supply, and has something in here went pop. Well, plenty of dust bunnies, but I don't see anything that looks obviously damaged. None of the capacitors have bulged or anything like that. I can't unfortunately just plug this in. It's got a German plug on the end of it, but that isn't gonna fit in there. So other than pulling the cable, say out of one of my power supplies, desoldering this and soldering in my cable to test with, other than that, the only other option is to get some sort of converter for the wall. I'll have a quick look on Amazon and if those converters are cheap enough, I'll just get one of those. But certainly nothing in here that looks obviously damaged, although that's not to say that there may not be a problem in here. But we'll be able to check that later when I can get it powered up. For now though, we'll just uh, pick out some of the dust and then take a look at this. I don't think those are the correct screws. That's a machine screw. And I don't think those are the right ones for the Amiga Plastics. Rather, I would expect it to be more that type of thread. Oh yes, and I forgot about this. He mentioned this to me. Someone has drilled a hole in the bottom of the case in two locations. Why would anyone ever do that? In fact, it almost looks like they've hit the PCB. 
In fact, they definitely have there because I can see track damage in there. Maybe that's why this 600 doesn't work. Well, the first thing that jumps out to me is that yes, the old capacitors have definitely leaked. If you look at the pads on those two, and in particular, actually that one, those are really dull. Compare them to the solder joints on the video encoder. Those are nice and bright. They're all dull. Those caps have all leaked. But I'll just continue stripping the rest of this down and then we'll get a better look at what we're dealing with. In particular, I want to take a closer look at that damage on the bottom. Yeah, those are the wrong screws as well. Those machine type screws should be in there. And oh yes, I forgot just how much fun it is to try and get an Amiga 600 motherboard out of the case. I'm sure there is a trick to this. It's just I've never quite figured it out. So other than just wrestling with it, is there a trick to removing this board? If anyone knows of a better way to get that out, please let me know. We can see some of Christian's handiwork here. As I was saying, he has started to fit ceramics here, but we'll remove those three. I think it's just those three that he had done. We'll remove those and fit the proper electrolytics. But look at the state of that. Why would anyone ever do that? They've drilled through the bottom of the case, through the shielding, straight into the motherboard. With that shielding removed then, we can better see the damage. On this side, well it's probably just dumb luck, but at this position here where the drill has come through the case on the shielding, it has crashed into that solder point. And while it has damaged the PCB there, that is just a ground plane. And so hopefully no real damage done. On the other side of the board though, well the damage here is more significant. The drill, when it's crashed into the PCB, has cut its way through three tracks. Although I think those three are just related to the floppy port. And so while it would render that useless, it shouldn't itself stop the Amiga from powering on. So we've got a bit of work to do. I think we'll just jump in, take off all the old capacitors. We can remove the RF modulator. Christian wants that gone anyway. To remove those two caps, as you know, I like to remove the keyboard connector and I'll remove the two audio jacks. But we'll take off all of that there so that we can do the recap. And then we'll have a think about repairing this damage. Is that something else damaged there as well? Just beside those points where Christian has tried to replace one of the three hole caps. Resistor R238, it almost looks as if there was something there that's maybe been knocked off. Although there are various spots about the board where there are no components fitted. There are pads for components but none fitted. So I can't say for sure. I'll have to double check that on the PCB Explorer. But let's take off what we can. So time for some hot air and plenty of this stuff. And yes, I always forget to put it on, but before I do anything else, the anti-static wrist strap. So let's see if we can get these ones off. Yeah, I can definitely smell leaked electrolytic. And I have accidentally removed one that I wasn't meant to. But just because I did accidentally knock that one off, let's just tidy up those pods now. I was just going to do all of this at the end. But we'll tidy it up now. Just go over these quickly with a bit of IPA. Let's take a little bit of flux down there. And then we'll put that capacitor back on. Let's just remove the rest of it.
we may have a problem. I think we might have just lost a pod. Now, as you've seen, I didn't use any excessive force. It was just the hot air. But I have a feeling that we lost the bottom pod here off that capacitor. Let's see if it'll tidy up, get a better look on it. That is very crispy. I'm really not sure if that pod is still there or not. Is it? Is that the pod there underneath? Whatever all that gunk is. I do hope it is. A bit of flux on it. See if that will help tidy it up a bit better. So yeah, the pod is still there. I just have no idea what all that crispy gunk was on top of it. Spilt electrolytic, I suppose. I'm not sure. It almost seems like glue or something. Very strange. I just went ahead and removed everything else. But we do unfortunately have two problems. One of them cropped up over here. Just on the underside of the board here. Where I removed one of the through hole caps that had been replaced previously. We've lost a pod. Now there's no trace on this side of the board. So I think what I'll do. Is when fitting the new capacitor here. The damage is from this point. We'll feed a wire down through the board with the leg of the new capacitor and bring that wire back and make it off onto that position there. The other bit of damage then is on the other side of the board. Yes, the bit of the board that I thought I had already sorted. Because I was going back over this, just going back over and cleaning this again. And the pods of that capacitor there, C303, well... Both of them have unfortunately detached from the PCB. See that one moving about. This one isn't just as loose, but the trace beside it, it has snapped. So yeah, bit of a problem. And to be perfectly honest with you, it is 100% my fault. You see, just before going over this again, the last thing that I was doing was removing that RF modulator. I needed an awful lot of heat. So I turned the temperature of the iron way, way up. But forgot about that. Went over these pods again with a bit more wick. A soldering iron that was screaming hot, well over 400 degrees. And I've wrecked it. Right. I took a decision here to remove both of those pods. Both of them were floating. So I don't much see the point in trying to save them. Cut them off. They're removed. But how are we going to fit the capacitor? It's this one here, a 47, 16 volt, 47 microfarad. Can we try and run a bit of wire, maybe from, say, that via there, down to where that pod was, do the same from that one, and then fit the capacitor to the wire? Or can I make them off onto the bottom of this cap without them falling off the board? Okay, I think that's it on. Granted though it is just floating there. So let's try and fit the other one, U304. Another 47 microfarad. Just want to tin up one of the pods first. Then we'll offer up the capacitor. Melt that solder again and hopefully get it stuck down. Right, at least that one went on a bit easier. The other capacitor in this area is this one here. C612. And when Christian first got his Amiga 600 here, it was giving them a problem in so much as it only displayed a black screen. And one very common failure point of the 600 is to just display a black screen and it's caused by this capacitor. This cap forms part of the reset circuit, along with uh, U14 there, the 555 timer. And when that cap fails, the system can't come out of reset. 
and it just sits on a black screen. That comes back then to why I was telling Christian originally that I think his machine just needed a recap. See how much easier it is when you have solid pods to work with? Well, it's a new day. Came out here to finish fitting the rest of the capacitors. And notice that the 47s that I had fitted it there, uh, yeah, they're wrong. They're meant to be 22s. So, taking them off again, but it's made me think about this damage here. I'm really not happy with the way I had repaired it with the little bits of wire. Let's try and repair it properly. I have some copper tape here, and what I'm going to try and do is cut this up to make new pads. Cut off one rectangle of it. And the idea will be to stick that down there. Now I do need to make that a little bit smaller. So it is self-adhesive stuff. Let's see if I can get the backing off it. And um, can I get this orientated properly and stuck down? Now I know you can buy proper kits to do this with. Truth told, this stuff is just copper tape, you know, like slug tape. But it should still do the same job. I just need to be very careful with the heat. That's the other one down. This is the first time I've ever attempted this. I'm pretty happy with that so far, to be honest. Now, I will still need the couple of little bits of wire. The other bit fell off, I'll have to put a new bit on. But I will need that to make connectivity onto those new pads. But my hope is this will just provide a more solid grounding for the capacitor to sit on. Let's try and tin up the pads here and see if this works. It's not bad. Certainly not for our first attempt at doing this sort of thing. So yeah, I'm reasonably happy with that. I mean, it obviously is still a bit loose. This stuff is meant to keep slugs away from your plants. It's, it's not meant to repair PCBs. The proper stuff that you can get has a high temperature glue on it. So every time I'm touching this with the iron, it's just melting the glue that's on this. But let's see if we can get a capacitor attached to that. Now, these are meant to be 22s. A little bit of flux there, we'll just help tidy that up. Same on the other side. And yeah, I am a lot more happy with that repair now. Okay, that's the recap complete. I've refitted the keyboard connector, the two audio jacks. The RF modulator is off, although I did go ahead and just fit all the capacitors in this area. I think you can leave off those uh, 100 microfarad caps if you're not fitting the modulator. Certainly those outside too. Not so sure about the middle one though. But I just refitted it all anyway. The modulator is going back with the Amiga. So if Christian in the future, for whatever reason, ever decided to refit that, at least he could do that without having to muck about with any capacitors. On this side of the board here, where the damage was, where my damage was, I just put a little bit of hot glue around that cap. Those new pads that I formed, uh, they were holding it okay, but it was a little bit loose, you know, you could wobble it a bit. So a little bit of hot glue just ensures that that can't move especially through shipping back to Germany and so hopefully no future problems arise. Yes that never should have happened in the first place and I have actually offered Christian a replacement motherboard. That was 100% my fault. I offered to replace the whole board, take the board out of my 600, he could have had that. But no he was happy enough with what I've done here. He just wants his board back. But the next thing that we need to do is try and repair this damage. So there's one, two, three traces broken. That fourth trace down, the damage on the board here does get very close to it, but I don't think that one's broken. And referring to PCB Explorer, that fourth trace should run between there and there. And that buzzes out okay. So it is just those three. So let's try and scratch off the solder mask here just to see what we're actually dealing with. 
just using the fiberglass pen for this. Now you can more clearly see the three cut traces. One, two, three. We were talking about why anyone would have ever done this, why anyone would have drilled holes in the bottom of their Amiga 600. The only thing that we can come up with is this was once a display piece on a wall. Someone has drilled holes in it to you know, hang it on screws or hooks or something. The only thing I can say to that really is if you want to display your vintage computers on the wall, buy a bracket that actually supports the computer or you can use those picture shelves from Ikea, the same ones that I'm using. So let's just turn up all that copper there. Then let's see if we can bridge across the gap. So a bit of flux, a bit of solder on the iron and a bit of our solid core wire. That's one. That's two. That's three. So let's just be sure we don't have any shorts or anything here. That all seems okay. And have we restored connectivity? So between there and there. Yep. Yep. And yes, that's all good. So I think that is everything. Does it work? Just using one of my spare power supplies for now. Gray screen, white screen. Yeah, it's looking good. It will sit on that white screen for a minute because there's no floppy drive. And there it is, 2.0 ROMs. Certainly seems as if the Amiga is working. Let's hook this up. Power on again. Yep, booting OK and I can hear the drive searching for a disk. It's clicking there. So let's give it one. Amiga test kit. And no, nothing. There are two switches here on the left hand side. One of them determines whether or not the disc is right protected. The other determines if there's a disc inserted. The drive is a bit dirty, so how about a bit of contact cleaner? Maybe they're just making a bad contact. Let's try it again. That's more like it. And it has indeed booted to Amiga Test Kit. Does it work? Yep, it seemed to. Start with a memory test. It only is the one megabyte. So this shouldn't take too long. And yeah, it's been right a couple of times there. It's fine. We'll come back to the keyboard. Let's just test that floppy drive. Yep, that's fine. 11, 11, that's what we're looking for. Controller ports, left and right mouse buttons are working okay. Let's plug this into the joystick port. Oh, well, that's working. Button one, button two, yeah. That's fine. Audio. Yeah, that sounds fine as well. Let's go through the channels. All good. Low pass filter. Yeah, that does sound like it's working. That's the test though, I'm sorry for the squeal. Yeah, that's working fine. Video already looks okay, but let's just take a look at the RGB gradient. And yeah, that looks fine. So it certainly seems at least that we have one fully working Amiga 600. Let's plug in its keyboard and let's see if this works. This is the green ribbon keyboard. 
There's also a blue ribbon. The blue ones do give problems, the green ones hopefully not. <laughs> he says. It's doing nothing. Spot the obvious mistake. I cannot believe this. How many mistakes am I going to make on this Amiga 600? Guess who put the keyboard connector in the wrong way around? I have had any amount of those off on Amigas and I've never done that before. Just give me five minutes. That looks a bit better. Let's try this again. Gonna have to give that floppy drive a clean. Sounds a bit scratchy there. Okay, F2. Yeah. That's better. One fully working keyboard. But this too could use a cleaning. Lots of dust bunnies on it. So I guess we should probably do that next. Right, the case has been cleaned. So I think we'll just stick the motherboard back in here. Oh, those holes. I just cut up a white paper label and stuck that over the top of them. Don't really have any means of repairing the plastic, but at least that will stop any dust or anything getting inside. That just lets me get that out of the way. The board will be safe back in its case like that. And then we can try and open this thing up. Give this a clean. May as well replace the capacitors in here while we're at it. Now, how does this come apart? So this is puzzling to say the least. I've got this back board, got that loose, and I've replaced that one 10 microfarad cap. There is another surface mounted cap just in there. But how do you strip this down any further? I have removed every screw that I can think of. And this drive mechanism, this does not want to come out. Well, we're in, and that was the magic bit. That had to come out to allow that to come off, which allows that to come off. And probably just as well, because I found this inside it. That is the spring out of a floppy disk. And it looks as if there's heat damage on that, on that metal. Which would make me think that's been sitting in here, shorting something out. I suppose it's a miracle that this worked at all. But that aside, we're in now and we can give it a clean. There is one more capacitor there to change. Another 10, 35 volt this time. There's a replacement for it there. To get that bottom PCB out, I would have to desolder that small ribbon that runs between the two. So I think we'll just try and change that in situ. But first of all, let me give it a clean. Filthy. Let's get this old cap off then. I think it's going to pop on me before it comes off. Yeah, it is. I'm going to do something here that is rather frowned upon. Let's cut it off. You can see the old cap has swollen quite a bit with the heat. It was about to explode on me. But the reason that it's not melting the solder there is probably because of this big aluminium body that is sucking away all the heat. So let's cut it off. I'm trying to go in here and cut the legs of the capacitor. That's one cut. That's it off. Yeah, not really recommended, but in this case it worked okay. I put quite a big blob of solder there on purpose. Just because things are a bit tight here for getting that cap in. The big blob just ensures that I can get the leg of it sat down into the solder okay. So just the other side to do. And I think that's us. Now, how does this go back together? Well, this bit's in the bottom. Let's try the disc. Yeah. 
that's fine. So if you ever find yourself with a Panasonic model number JU253043P floppy drive and you're wondering how to get it apart, take that plastic bit out first. You get that out of the way, that allows the bottom section of the carriage to be pushed right up into the drive which allows the top to pop out then the bottom comes out and you're in. Right, let's finish off with a quick look at this power supply. What's it doing? I got an adapter for the plug, so let's just try it. If I pull up a pin out of the Amiga's power jack, so that is ground up there. 12 volt in the opposite corner, 11.9, that's okay. Negative 12 volt in the middle, negative 11.8, that's okay. And 5 volt in the bottom right hand corner, 6.3, that is definitely not okay. Well, no, I have fiddled with that quite a bit, and if anything, it's only getting worse. So, something definitely wrong with this power supply. There's a lot of hot glue on all these caps though, so I'll need to try and get all that off. Let's do those two first. 50 volt and 1 UF. Yes, I need to put new hot glue in around that. I can do that in a minute. But let's see what it's outputting. So, check that 5 volt reel. And it's still 6.4. Let's try something. I was having a quick chat with some of the guys on Discord. And Sparks UK suggested that these lightweight Amiga 600 power supplies their 5 volt output might be a bit high, unless it has load. Now this is one scrap Amiga 500 board. Yes, it is missing the chipset. I suppose we could put a CPU in. Although, no, let's not do that. I don't want to kill the 60,000. But the rest of the components on this, well, if it goes up in smoke, it doesn't really matter. But let's put power through this board and see what the 5 volt level is. I can just measure it here across one of the logic chips and it's 5.5 volts so yeah that has settled down quite a bit is that something I can maybe take up in the trim cap though because remember I was farting about with that maybe I have upset it and I'd say that's pretty bang on I'm happy enough with that Although I suppose that board is still missing part of the chipset, so let's just give it a tiny tweak. If we can get it to read 5 volts dead on, I'll be happy at that. Yeah, that's close enough. But out of interest, back on the bench with no load. What's that 5 volt rail doing now? Is it back up to 6.4? And yeah, more or less, 6.3. So is that the case? It does. The lightweight 600 power supply doesn't need some load to bring it down in the spec. Certainly appears as though that's the case. Well, I think that'll do for this video. I'll get the 600 and its power supply all boxed up again. Get them back on the road, back to Germany, back to Christian. I suppose the main thing to take away from this video, or the main thing that I need to take away from this video is to take my time a bit more. Maybe if I had done that, I wouldn't have caused that damage to the PCB here. Okay, it has been repaired, but it was my fault. I have to hold my hands up and say that. It never should have happened in the first place.
And the other thing that we learned was that those lightweight power supplies, these things, well, yeah, unless there's a load connected to them, the 5 volt reel on these is going to read a bit high. I want to say thank you to Christian for giving me the opportunity to work on his Amiga 600. And that's it. So thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Why not hit subscribe if you haven't done so already. Still plenty more yet to come here on CRG. And I'll see you next time.